I just want to start by saying uh, that I'm truly honored to be able to serve as uh, president for ASNIC in 2022, and I take this responsibility very seriously and will do my very best to meet the needs of our members and of the uh, nuclear cardiology community. Uh, I'm going to uh, just talk a little bit about me for those of you who don't know me, and then I'm going to give you some uh, of my thoughts about the current state of nuclear cardiology and ASNIC. And then finally, uh, give some uh, ideas of how ASNIC will continue to ensure that nuclear cardiology continues to thrive in 2022 and beyond. Uh, I received my engineering degree from Penn State University, but that's not the most important thing that I got from Penn State. The most important thing is that's where I met my wife, uh, Jackie, and we've been married for 31 years. I then went on to medical school at Penn State University College of Medicine in Hershey and then on to internal medicine residency at University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. The next stop for us was cardiology fellowship and nuclear cardiology research fellowship at the University of Virginia. And this was very impactful for me. I had the great opportunity to work with Dr. George Beller on clinical and experimental research. And Dr. Beller opened many doors for me through ASNIC and through the Journal of Nuclear Cardiology. And I will be forever grateful for his impact on my career. I also had the opportunity to work with Dr. David Glover, who taught me many things, including uh, myocardial uh, blood flow physiology, how to measure myocardial blood flow, myocardial tracer kinetics, and vasodilator stress. We had the opportunity to work with some of the adenosine A2A receptors long before they were clinically available, and uh, I owe a lot to Dr. Glover as well. I also had the opportunity to work with Dr. Denny Watson, who taught me how to interpret uh, perfusion studies, both planar and SPECT, and how to use quantitative methods for assessing perfusion and function, and uh, he really taught me a lot as well. At UVA, I had the chance to work with several other uh, co-investigators, uh, including very brilliant people like Dr. Sanjeev Call and Jonathan Lindner, and there were some visiting uh, people like Dr. Gerald Vanzetto and Paula Simonio, who visited us during my time there, who uh, are still part of the nuclear cardiology community and very active. From there, I went on to uh, my present location at the Ohio Health's Riverside Methodist Hospital, uh, joining Dr. Ann Graywall, who was a founding uh, member of our cardiac imaging division. And I now have the opportunity to work with uh, this large group of uh, individuals who is, are part of our advanced cardiac imaging team uh, day to day, where we take care of the needs of a very, very busy hospital. One last thing about me is that 2022 is a big year for my family as well. My son, Alex, is graduating from law school in May and will be taking a job with a law firm in Cleveland. My daughter, Jameson, will be graduating from high school a couple weeks later. And in August, my family will get bigger as my son marries his fiance, Yi Chen. Uh, so 2022 is a big year for uh, my family and me and a big year for ASNIC, of course, as well. Now I'm gonna turn my uh, thoughts to the state of nuclear cardiology. Nuclear cardiology procedures are trusted by clinicians to guide patient management. Myocardial perfusion imaging has stood the tests of time and it is still valuable and used every single day to help manage patients. Nuclear imaging has unrivaled versatility and feasibility, uh, the, the ability to do it with exercise or pharmacologic stress, renal failure patients, patients with implanted electronic devices, uh, patients with elevated or regular heart rates, patients with prior revascularization or severe coronary calcification, obese patients. There's really uh, very few, if any, uh, contraindications to nuclear imaging other than uh, inability to obtain IV access. PET is becoming more widely available and PET has the potential to really revolutionize uh, nuclear cardiology with all of the advantages in terms of accuracy, but myocardial perfusion imaging is predominantly performed uh, with SPECT, with a 10 to 1 ratio of SPECT to PET among Medicare patients. Myocardial blood flow, in my opinion, is a game changer uh, and is a major strength of PET, but is also becoming available with SPECT, which we'll, you'll hear more about at this meeting. And there are exciting applications beyond myocardial perfusion imaging. Uh, Technetium pyrophosphate imaging has really transformed the diagnosis and management of patients with cardiac amyloidosis. And FDG PET imaging is being used routinely to evaluate patients for suspected sarcoidosis 
and infection. So I think the state of the field of nuclear cardiology in 2021 is very, very strong. What about the state of ASNIC? Well, it starts with strong leadership and dedicated staff. These are the staff members uh, currently listed in alphabetical order. I wanna call out especially uh, Dr. Linda Gearing for a very, very well-deserved Distinguished Service Award. I've had the opportunity to work with her on projects for many years. And I also wanna make a special point uh, to recognize the uh, Chief Executive o Officer, Dr. Kathy Flood, who navigated smoothly through the COVID pandemic and other challenges over the last few years. I believe that ASNIC is strong because our leader, Kathy Flood, is strong. The state of ASNIC also is strong because of the legacy of thoughtful physician leaders. This is a photo taken a couple years ago during the 25th anniversary of ASNIC, which shows uh, many, uh, if not all of the previous uh, past presidents of ASNIC. These people had the vision to establish ASNIC and they had the passion and commitment to move the field of nuclear cardiology forward in the right direction. And all of us now are standing on their uh, very broad shoulders. Not shown in the picture is Dr. Sharmila Dorbala, our president in 2020, who dealt with the onset of the COVID pandemic and all the uncertainty that that entailed and did a fabulous job getting us through that year. And Dr. Randy Thompson, our current president, who I've had a, a close uh, sort of a front row view of his work this year. And I'm amazed by how hard he has worked uh, on behalf of our uh, needs and our, of our membership. And it's my hope that I can, you know, even get close to living up to the very high uh, bar that these people have set. ASNIC is also strong because we're recognized as a leader in health policy and advocacy. Dr. Bill Van Decker led our efforts for many years. And in my opinion, he knows more about health policy than any other human being on the planet. Uh, it's now uh, led by Dr. David Walensky, my friend, uh, with the help of Georgia Lawrence and the committee. And I'm impressed by the fact that ASNIC advocacy is proactive rather than reactive. An example, as uh, Dr. Thompson mentioned, is the uh, AUC mandate issue. ASNIC recognized the potential for disruption of medical care with this policy many years ago before any other medical societies even had it on their radar and began lobbying efforts. And now more than 30 other medical societies have uh, joined in, but ASNIC was really the leader and continues to be the leader with regards to advocacy and health policy. ASNIC is also strong because of the support of our industry partners. Our industry partners have provided much of the innovation that has moved the field forward over the past few decades, and we are grateful for this. These are our gold sponsors uh, for this current annual uh, meeting. These is the bronze sponsor and our other exhibitors. Without the financial support of our industry sponsors, we would be unable to provide the high quality education that we've uh, uh, always been able to offer over the years. The state of ASNIC is also strong because of our outstanding education. Randy pointed out many of the educational activities that are coordinated by our current chair of the education committee, Karthik. Um, we also have outstanding guidelines and scientific statements uh, under the leadership of Andrew Einstein, our new uh, MASNIC uh, member. And uh, we're grateful to both of them for their efforts. With regards to education, we're thinking about things differently. ASNIC has uh, uh, surveyed our membership and found, not surprisingly, that different segments of our uh, membership has different uh, uh, priorities for educational topics. Our fellows in training request more information about SPECT interpretation and PET interpretation. Our early career members are interested in learning about the new things like cardiac PET and myocardial blood flow with SPECT and PET and cardiac amyloid. Our mid-career members are interested in the new things like cardiac amyloid, as well as improving the quality and efficiency of SPECT. Our technologists want more information about increased quality and efficiency of SPECT, as well as some of the new things on the road. So ASNIC Educational Committee plans to take this into account and try to meet the differing needs of our different uh, members. We also know that the world is changing, just like the world of media, and entertainment has changed and the world of photography has changed. So has the uh, appetite for uh, medical education. And ASNIC is adapting rapidly to this. We know that many of you prefer the virtual live or virtual on-demand uh, 
mode of receiving your education for the convenience and, and decreased cost and decreased need to travel. And we've been doing a very good job of this and we'll continue to do this in the future, even long after the uh, COVID pandemic uh, uh, re uh, recedes. Uh, some of us uh, crave getting back to live in-person meetings for the informal social interactions and the informal discussions that can take place one-on-one, -on -one, uh, sort of getting ideas from other members uh, in an easier format. And then there are hybrid approaches combining some live and some uh, virtual, uh, which we're exploring as well. The state of ASNIC is also strong because of the Journal of Nuclear Cardiology under the leadership of Dr. Amy Iskandrian. Randy already mentioned that the impact factor is higher now than ever, and that's because of the very strong steady uh, leadership of Dr. Iskandrian. Our international reach is also broad, as Randy also mentioned. Uh, congratulations to Dr. Better for his MASNIC designation. And ASNIC currently has plans in place for meetings in all of these locations uh, in the next year or so, including uh, a meeting, a joint meeting with the Saudi Heart Association uh, later this coming week. Uh, so we certainly welcome more participation by all of our international uh, members, and uh, we'd be interested in establishing relationships with other societies as well. The leadership development program participants are shown here. And this may be the best idea that ASNIC has ever had. In fact, if imitation is the best form of flattery, uh, this would be an example because many other uh, medical societies are now starting to develop leadership development programs of their own in order to ensure that their societies also reload rather than rebuild. And that's what ASNIC has been doing for quite some time under the current leadership of Dr. Larry Phillips and all of our volunteer mentors who helped to make this happen. But there are some threats to nuclear cardiology as well. We surveyed our membership and asked them, what, are, what do you perceive as the biggest threats to the field of nuclear cardiology in the years ahead? And our members responded with several, uh, competing imaging modalities, declining reimbursement, the need for modernization, prior authorization and test substitution, and misrepresentation of clinical trial results. And when nuclear cardiology is doing well, we also become a target uh, for others who uh, perhaps want to uh, attack. So uh, there, there's uh, things uh, happening that we need to be aware of. This is a sponsored webinar series uh, from a company saying why atherosclerosis is all that really matters. Uh, the subliminal message there is that ischemia detection and myocardial perfusion imaging is uh, less relevant or less needed. Uh, this is a front page uh, from another uh, company's website that says, we joke that nuclear medicine is unclear medicine because the images are blurry, uh, obviously not huge proponents of nuclear uh, cardiology testing. This is uh, a publication published last year that many of you have probably seen, which came as a result of a uh, group meeting looking for ways to improve access to coronary CTA and overcoming some of the barriers to adoption of coronary CTA. When it was published in Jack last year, it was perceived by many to represent a actual position statement by American College of Cardiology stating that coronary CTA should be performed first in evaluating patients with uh, stable coronary artery disease. This was certainly not the, uh, the position of the, of the American College of Cardiology, but it was certainly perceived that way by some people. Some of you will also recall a, a New England Journal uh, debate published looking at uh, different ways to assess patients with suspected coronary artery disease. And in the argument for coronary CTA, they quoted an abstract taken from data from the ischemia trial that uh, stated that the anatomical extent and burden of coronary artery disease as assessed on coronary CT angiography was highly predictive of death in myocardial infarction, whereas severity of ischemia was not. Of course, those of us who understand the trial design of the ischemia trial and the patient population understand that this type of conclusion can really not be made from this type of trial. Nonetheless, when this type of uh, a statement gets published in New England Journal and gets repeated by others and gets amplified on social media, uh, we need to be aware that this is the sort of the prevailing uh, public opinion, which is again why we have such a strong social media task force. Uh, this was launched in February of 2020 around the same time that the world turned upside down with the COVID pandemic. 
led by Dr. Renee Bullock Palmer and Dr. Nidhi Agarwal. Um, our, uh, this society, uh, uh, the social media task force has been very strong at uh, promoting and getting out the message of all the valuable contributions and new advances in nuclear cardiology. And in fact, as uh, Dr. Slomka mentioned, uh, last year at the annual meeting, there were over 13 million uh, Twitter impressions uh, created by this task force. And this year, as of last evening, there were already over 5.1 million Twitter impressions. So I encourage those of you who are Twitter savvy to go ahead and tweet uh, the things that excite you about the meeting and spread the word. So ASNIC is making plans to address all of the threats to our field with solutions. Uh, in order to address declining reimbursement, we're looking at education targeted at laboratory efficiency, staffing and scheduling, and more education about coding, payment, and reimbursement. With regards to the misinformation and competing modalities, we're going to provide you with tools to educate referring physicians, payers, and policymakers uh, regarding the strengths and limitations of imaging in a multimodality world. And we're going to help set the record straight regarding the implications of clinical trials that are being misrepresented. In terms of test substitution, we're going to provide uh, our members with tools to help with their appeals and denials from uh, RBMs and private payers. And we're going to help uh, educate you in order to empower you to be a patient advocate with payers and policymakers. With regard to the need for modernization, we're going to provide information about how to incorporate PET into your lab and how to add other things like attenuation correction and calcium scoring and myocardial blood flow to SPECT, how to convince your administrators to invest in upgrades, and how to help you be prepared for what's coming next on the horizon. You've already heard mention of the Patient First initiative. I'm wearing my button as well, which I know might be hard to see uh, with the video view. Again, this is a big priority for ASNIC. ASNIC is and always has been a Patient First organization. And ASNIC's priority is and always will be the patient, not the test. Uh, but we want to focus on doing the right test at the right time for the right reason and done the right way. And this is what we're going to focus on uh, in the future for sure. So I wanted to conclude by mentioning some things I learned from the SPEC Virtual Reading Room faculty. As Randy mentioned, I had the opportunity of uh, hosting these seven uh, sessions during this past summer. Uh, from excellent faculty from around the country and, and faculty from South America. And I learned things from all the faculty, but I wanted to point out several things that I really took away from these sessions. One is that a consistent, high quality structured report is as important as acquiring high quality spec myocardial perfusion images. I learned this from uh, Panithia Cherian Tatatui from Mayo Clinic who showed how her report is so consistent reader to reader and so structured that her referring physicians always can uh, derive the information they need to make patient management decisions. And I think this is something that we all need to strive for. Um, I also learned that attenuation correction should be routinely performed on all SPECT MPI studies. I learned this from Dr. Lane Duval and his uh, team at Hartford who are able to perform this on every patient either by using SPECT CT or by using two position imaging on their CZT camera, or in patients who can't perform two position imaging, they acquire a CT scan separately on the SPEC CT scanner and import the CT images into the CZT uh, camera to uh, perform attenuation uh, correction. So uh, this is not easy, it takes effort, but they make it happen because they're committed to providing high quality imaging and Dr. Duvall showed how this attenuation correction really helps with interpretation and uh, confidence of interpretation. I also learned that calcium scoring can be included as part of the routine SPECT myocardial perfusion imaging protocol. I learned this from Dr. Randy Thompson, whose laboratory makes an effort to perform calcium scoring on all patients who do not have a history of established uh, coronary artery disease or previous revascularization. And this is also not always easy. They have to sometimes acquire the calcium score on separate equipment but they find that it is so helpful and useful. Obviously patients with uh, normal myocardial perfusion imaging studies and zero calcium score have an excellent short-term and long-term prognosis, whereas patients with uh, normal perfusion but severe coronary calcification require closer follow-up and aggressive medical therapy for prevention. This is something that we can take advantage of 
uh, now in order to increase the value of our nuclear uh, cardiology procedures. And finally, I learned that myocardial blood flow and myocardial blood flow reserve can be measured using currently available uh, SPECT camera. I learned that from Dr. Ron Schwartz in Rochester, who is using it currently and routinely with SPECT imaging, and it is helping him manage his patients. So ASNIC needs your help. I have already told you what ASNIC is going to do for you, uh, but we also need your help. All of us, physicians, technologists, and industry need to work together to educate our referring physicians, payers, and policymakers regarding the clinical value of nuclear cardiology to ensure continued patient access. And we need to modernize our protocols and equipment. We need to use attenuation correction routinely like Dr. Duvall does. We need to combine myocardial perfusion imaging with coronary calcium assessment the way Dr. Thompson does. And we need to begin to incorporate myocardial blood flow with SPECT the way Dr. Schwartz does. I know this isn't easy, and I know it's much easier to simply uh, stay with what we're comfortable with and acquire our studies the way we've been doing it for years uh, without some of these extra uh, efforts that are required. But let me tell you, it's not easy for those labs that are doing it either. They just made a commitment to make it happen. And we really need to, in my opinion, make this happen in order for our field to stay successful in the years ahead. We need to modernize. As uh, John F. Kennedy said, there are risks and costs to a program of action, but they are far less than the long range risks and costs of comfortable inaction. Or as uh, Nelson Mandela said, it always seems impossible until it's done. And finally, I wanna leave you with this image. Uh, this was me and 110,000 of my uh, closest friends who gathered two weeks ago uh, for the Auburn game. Uh, all of us had one goal in mind and it showed us that just like our nuclear cardiology community, we can do amazing things if we all work together. So I wanna thank you for your attention. Thank you again for the opportunity to serve as the ASNIC president 2022. You can reach me at my uh, email address shown here. You can reach ASNIC uh, directly if you want to find out how you can help with our efforts at info at asnic.org. Uh, Thank you. Mm -hmm.